well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to somehow launch this uh, this uh, summer school. And as I wrote in my title, well, this is something that was uh, that was scheduled last year, but for obvious reason, we had to postpone that. So, but I saved the the title, being very optimistic. Uh, up to up to today, but evidently, well, now we are online. Uh, the message is: uh, I would like to convey first is: uh, please do not hesitate to raise questions if there are any, and if I if I can answer, then I well just simply interrupt me. And the idea is somehow to guide you through well short, what in 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 a very well let's say. Uh, 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 easy way into the Hartree-Fox theory somehow without, you know, well, somehow getting into too many technical details and rather to emphasize on the on, on the physical concept that that are behind uh, Hartree-Fox theory. Okay, so this will be somehow the, well, let's say, um, the uh, starting point of the summer school, not just that, but also the, the starting point of the construction of what we're all interested in in in, in the wave uh, function theory, in the construction of, of a wave function. So that's uh, that will be essentially the, the goal of this uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, here's somehow, well, the um, an overview of, of what I will talk about. Uh, we will get into the, the N electron problem in a very general way. And I will somehow, well, get into the uh, well, the, the structure of the Hartree-Fock uh, wave function into the independent electron approximation. We will talk about atomic orbitals, AOs, and molecular orbitals, where evidently electron-electron interactions, and I guess that we're all uh, well, somehow very much concerned about that. And what I highlighted in red are the, let's say, the, the most important uh, messages that I would like to, to, to convey. So this is the idea of a self-consistent field and in particular in the Hartree-Fock theory, the self-consistent field method, and well, derived in a very brief way. As I told you, I won't get into too many details into the Hartree-Fock equations. And rather than, well, extending the derivation of those equations that can be found in some textbook references that I will give you at the very end of my presentation, we will somehow concentrate on something which is a uh, which is very appealing in the sense that we can derive most of the uh, of the equation on a on a blackboard or on a, on a whiteboard or on a slide for today, uh, the H two molecule. So I will I will say a few things on, on H two, uh, give some important theorems that we that are extremely uh, useful in the uh, in the context of wave function construction, but evidently, uh, Hartree-Fock is not the the holy grail. So we will try to see what, what when Hartree-Fock breaks down, and that will somehow make connection with some, some subsequent lectures, and in particular configuration interaction techniques, and also um, perturbation theories and some conclusions. So once again, well, thank you for being all around and uh, attending this uh, lecture. And again, do not hesitate to, to interrupt me if there are any questions. Okay, so back to the N electron problem. I suppose that this is a very, uh, well, I would say uh, you're all familiar with that. So I will consider an N electron system consisting of M ions. And I will use those letters, even though, well, you know, we will somehow leave out the, the ions and essentially con concentrate on the, on the electron. And therefore, essentially talk about the so-called light particles. As we know, the mass of the electron is much smaller than the mass of a protons so of any any nucleus and the capital letters refer to the heavy particles so once again the the nucleus so the nucleus essentially generates some sort of an attractive field that is uh, this particular contribution to the overall hamiltonian where you can recognize well the kinetic energy of the electrons in using atomic units for simplicity the kinetic energy of the ions the, the terms that I've just mentioned, so that is the electron nucleus attractions, and that's the so-called, let's say, external potential to make contact with some subsequent lectures that will come throughout uh, this uh, summer school. Uh, this is the, uh, just simply speaking, the, the nucleus, nucleus uh, repulsion, and here's the problem in red, the electron-electron uh, interaction, so the one over R, I, J, so the Rij being the distance inter-electron 
distance. And this is where we're all around. And just to well, somehow cope with this particular contribution in the, in, the, in the Hamiltonian. For the sake of simplicity, and I will concentrate on that, so I will consider the, the ions as, as frozen particles. So this contribution is simply a constant, and I will not be concerned about the kinetic energy of the ions. Okay, so let me start with something which is, um, well, which would be rather crude, but as we can see, this contribution makes the electron non-independent particles, and this is why we have to make approximated solution. And the idea, again, is to start with a very rough approximation, but some probably some kind of calculation some of you might be aware of, and this is the so-called non-interacting electron case. In this context, everything is as if this contribution, so the, the one we're, uh, we're talking about that makes the electron non-independent particles, this one over R i j contribution, is simply set to zero. So this is just not, this is just for, well, it's a very simple way to, uh, to, to, to set the stage, but this is just neglecting somehow, if you want to think in such a way, the electron-electron repulsion. In this context, well, the, the Hamiltonian is just a one electron contributions. So this is the, the one electron operator acting on electron I, I running from one to N. And in this context, as you may expect, and as everyone would, would suspect, is that the total energy reads simply as the sum over the occupied levels Okay, I again running from one to n. And that's the, let's say, the, the context of one method that is very common in chemistry, but not just in chemistry, but also in physics, which is the so called Huckel method or tight binding approximation. So non interacting electrons, so this is, this is a one electron operator, one electron Hamiltonian, and it's very convenient, very simple. We know that there are some approximation, but the, probably the, the the interesting point is that in the, on that particular example, which is a butadiene molecule, when you go from the molecule to the anion, so simply speaking, adding one electron, well, what you can simply write is that the energy of the n plus one system is just the energy of the n system plus the energy of the extra electron that has been added. So that makes life very easy, but we know that it's a, it's a, very, it's a very harsh approximation. So we have to work a little bit more on that in order to make contact with reality. Okay, so let me start step by step. And again, if there are some, well, some, some, some points that must be clarified, do not hesitate. So I will start with the simplest thing that we can consider is atomic orbitals. So atomic orbitals, in order to generate molecular orbitals using the very, well, let's say, standard structuration, which is the building up at, from atomic orbitals, making linear combination of those in order to generate molecular orbitals. But let me start with something, the, the simplest object that we can think of in the context of quantum chemistry. So by definition, an orbital is an eigenfunction of a monoelectronic problem. So therefore it's, it satisfies this kind of equation with the very important condition that makes quantization, the fact that the solution we're interested in should satisfy this, this uh, normalization property. And this is the essence of, that's the origin of the probability interpretation, the, the, the reasoning that, we, that people, that, that we have in, for instance, density functional theory that we, you will see later on. So by making linear combination of those object where we can build some molecular orbital by simply uh, summing up over the, uh, the uh, making some linear combination. I'm sorry, this should be a different index because the number of electrons doesn't have to be the number of um, orbitals evidently. And in order to make contact with practical, let's say, uh, uh, calculations that some of you may have performed, I gave like two examples of, let's say, types of of uh, orbitals, atomic orbitals that we like to use. So if you think of a Huckel description of a conjugated system, so alternation of uh, simple and double bonds, well, you may just use uh, some 2p type orbital and we call this simple zeta. In comparison with example number two, if you want to somehow extend 
this Huckel approximation, what you want to make will have a more freedom in the description of the electrons, have something which is, let's say, increase accuracy, but evidently increase in terms of uh, computational costs. Well, you may use, instead of having just one Slater type orbital, which would be this kind of function, well, you make a linear combination of those. And this is what we call multiple zeta. So these are the two, well, these are two among a collection of a basis set that you can think of, but these are the typical function that people like to manipulate running those simplest description of electronic systems. So neglecting somehow the electron electron interactions. Well, maybe some words of caution is that, well, actually the there are some parameters in most of those methods and introducing parameters uh, is a way somehow to uh, to make contact with experiments. So these interactions, which are not explicitly taken into account in this uh, one electron operator, were are somehow well mimicked by the choice of a, of parameters and by using a, a, the, a, the, the, the appropriate uh, set of parameters, you may somehow make contact with the experiments. And this is why those methods are quite often referred to as uh, semi-empirical methods. Okay, I won't say more on that, but rather like as, a, as some sort of an introduction, just to make sure that we're all on the same page is that in order to build up some molecular orbitals, well, essentially the strategy is the one that we, 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 we're all uh, aware of, is build up some linear combination of atomic orbitals. There's one question that still we have to answer because we know that electrons do see each other and how are we gonna cope with that? And that's essentially the, let's say the, the, the scope of this, uh, this presentation. So let me move on to electron-electron interactions and now somehow switching on the electron-electron repulsion. So we make now this contribution in the, in the Hamiltonian different from zero. And well, I will somehow follow the probably historically the, the very first uh, IDs that the people came up in, the, in this context, which are the Hartree's uh, IDs and Hartree's assumption. So there are essentially three of them that I will list shortly. So the first one is that we will consider instantaneous interaction. And therefore, there will be some sort of an average, we will consider electron-electron interaction in, such, in, in an average way. Okay, in that sense, the, the idea is to consider spherical, it's spherical for atoms. So there will be no instantaneous interaction and we'll see in the following, uh, what, what kind of problem we may have with this sort of uh, uh, preliminary uh, uh, assumption. Well, the second one is that, well, we want to reach something that we will call, refer to, and that will come later on again in the Hartree-Fucker description, self-consistency. So what do I mean by self-consistency? Well, just think of one electron interacting with a, with a, with a, with a set of uh, in, a, in, a, in an atom, for instance, where there are a collection of electrons, well, this particular electron occupies some, let's say, phi i atomic orbitals. Well, automatically, it's going to generate some Coulomb interactions with the other electrons, and you may have automatically to solve this particular eigenfunction problem, defining some phi i tilde wave function, because this electron do see the other electrons and generate, let's say, a new set of in this context, atomic orbitals. So we know that, well, since electrons do see each other, and this is the context that I've chosen over here, well, we have to explicitly take into account the electron-electron interaction. There might be some, some tricks or some, some ways, in particular, averaging of all those interactions, but this is something that we don't want to leave out of the, of the description of reality. So we may start with some sort of an approximation and somehow update the interaction by explicitly taking into account the electron-electron interaction, rewrite the eigenfunction, eigenvalue problem, and produce a new set of atomic orbitals. And self-consistency means that the, the let's say, the, the input into the generation of the Coulomb-Coulomb interaction should be, well, let's say, 
close to the output one. So this means that the difference between the norm of the difference between these two functions, so the input function and the output ones, the one that is produced by the diagonalization of this Hamiltonian goes to zero. We'll see that, how, how it goes and how, how we can derive that. The third uh, well condition that has to be a full field, and that comes from, strictly speaking, from quantum mechanics, uh, this is the so-called Pauli exclusion principle, and that can be stated as follows, is that no two electrons with same spin in the same orbital. Okay, so this is something that we're all aware of, and we don't want to have, uh, we want to, to stay away from that, because this otherwise has some important laws of uh, quantum mechanics uh, breakdown. Okay, so, so much for this, um, uh, for this, uh, uh, description and uh, let me somehow well get into uh, the uh, the self-consistent field method and in the context of for, for the sake of simplicity for the to start with for atomic calculations okay so the first uh, the first uh, description that naively comes into uh, our mind is the following is that we can think of the electrons moving independently uh, one from the other so if psi, the, the wave function, so the structure that we're looking, we're interested in, depends on the, on the coordinate of each individual electrons. Okay, so this is the position with respect to the nucleus. This is the, these are the two uh, angles. And uh, well, this wave function that depends on three times N, capital N, N being the total number of electrons, is simply written as a product of function that depends on the coordinate of just one single electron. You know, in other words, we want to start with something which is very simple, or that's probably the, well, one way to look at the problem is to say that psi is just a product of those orbitals. The way I define an orbital is a one electron wave function. Okay, and by writing this down, we generate what we call a Hartree product. And that can be stated, uh, that can be written, in, well, that could be uh, considered as a, let's say, as a, as a starting point. Okay, so for the hydrogen atom, for instance, we know, I mean, if you go to some, um, well, quantum mechanics textbooks, for instance, what is just a one electron, one electron um, system. So evidently there's no electron electron interaction in this particular system, but still we get some inspiration from the uh, hydrogen atom structure is that the the orbital so the, the eigen eigen function reads as a polynomial that can be written in such a way times some function that depends on these on these angles okay and these particular ylm functions are the very famous spherical harmonics and for instance if l equals zero then you know that automatically m should be zero and this is this so-called one s or s type orbitals and this is just a polynomium. I, I'm, I'm not so much concerned about that, but just to somehow get back to what I said previously, is that this polynomial, well, uh, somehow behavior is what well, you should just keep in mind is that it's uh, ex exponentially decaying with, with the distance. So R is the distance, uh, the distance separation between the electron and the nucleus. But if we re rewrite in a, well, simply just to change the notation, to have something which is a little bit more compact, while well, the Hamiltonian kinetic energy, electron nucleus uh, attraction, in that particular case, there's just one single nucleus because I'm, I'm mostly interested in atoms in this context. So this is just one atom, the charge of which is capital Z. So this is the nucleus electron attraction. And here we are with the electron electron repulsion. So in this, the first part of the Hamiltonian over here, as you can see, is just a summation over I. So this is just a one electron contribution to the, to the Hamiltonian. Whereas the red part that you can see on, the, on, this, on this side that I wrote as Gij is uh, a two electron contribution. And that has to do with the electrostatic, evidently electron electron repulsion. And that's something that is, well, probably that governs evidently the uh, properties, electronic, uh, electronic structures is that there's this, this somehow competition or to the two, the, these two contribution that govern the, the behavior of electrons is that there's a one electron contribution and a two electron contribution. And that's 
something that is inherent to the structure of the of the system that we are interested in. So ele ele electron electronic distribution. Coming from let's say well classical mechanics, electrostatics, what you may expect evidently that you know that if there is some sort of a one electron sitting in the phi i orbital, then automatically it's going to generate some phi i square electronic distribution. Well, probability of finding electron one in in the in the in in, in, the, in a, some sort of a volume around R one, and same thing for electron number two sitting in some orbitals that is characterized by phi j and phi j star times phi j is phi j squares and that has to do with the with the probability of finding electron number two in the vicinity in a region surrounding r2 and from standard electrostatic you know that you have some sort of a electron electron repulsion contribution that simply arises as well, the product of the charges divided by the distance and this is precisely what we have over here right this is the electron number one electron number two in terms of density dr1 dr2 makes local well infinitesimal charges repelling each other divided by r12 and that has to do with the with the energy the repulsion energy this kind of integral that is called the coulomb integral for a very expected reason will be denoted in this lecture as IIJJ. Just think of a electron number one occupying I orbital, generating the probability of finding electron number one is given by I square, and the probability of finding electron number two is given by J square. And therefore, by integrating over R1 and R2, automatically you get the Coulomb repulsion of those two uh, electronic distribution, charge distribution. So that's something very expected, I would say, coming from classical, classical mechanics or classical description of, uh, of electrons. Well, evidently, well, we have to, we have to, we, we, we have to, well, go into a little bit more details. And what we want to generate is some Hartree product by minimizing the expectation value of the Hamiltonian for that particular Hartree product. So what I wrote over here is that this is a this is the expectation value averaging using the uh, Hartree the Hartree assumption so in a, using spherical distribution and we want to make this quantity stationary so we want to by varying each individual atomic orbital structure making the energy minimal okay so that's what's behind the so-called Hartree's equation I would like to shortly guide you into. So let me get back to the averaging of the charge distribution. Well, this is just by well integrating over all the angles, you know, theta and phi that I defined previously. And therefore we are left with some sort of a charge at the distance R1, which is given by this polynomial okay, square, because well, we, this is the, the expectation value, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the probability of finding electron number one. So this goes like this quantity square. That's for electron number one, the same thing. And from that, we can evaluate the energy generated using spherical averaging generated by the interaction between these two electrons, one in the vicinity of R1 and the second one in the vicinity of R2. I, if I may, and do not hesitate if there are any questions, but this is just using the so-called Gauss theorem. You can automatically evaluate well, the, the energy and the, the electrostatic energy by integrating over, over R1 and R2. And you're left with this kind of quantity, which is the electron-electron interaction using spherical averaging for the, these two charge distributions. And as you can see, well, this, this has to do with well, the charge generated by electron number one and charge electron number two. And you, as you can recognize, this is the, ele the electron electron separation. Well, R max between being the maximum between R1 and R2. But this, these are just technical details. This is just to give you something that, that can be um, introduced in order to somehow generate the expectation value over here. And by minimizing this quantity, you automatically, well, you, you, you plug that into the Schrodinger equation and you get this kind of expression. 
So briefly speaking, what you can recognize over here with somehow skipping some of the details, well, this, is, this has to, to do with the kinetic energy. Okay, this is a second derivative. This has to do with the fact that the electron is uh, somehow rotating in a very, uh, very pictorial way description, rotating around the, um, the, the nucleus. And there you're left with something that looks very much like the, the electrostatic interaction. So the fact that the electron gets attracted by the nucleus. But as you can see, this is not the, just the charge of the nucleus, but this is something that chemists like to manipulate very much. This is a so-called screen nucleus. And actually screening has to do with this why not quantity that I define over here. So actually there's a way to evaluate this quantity, this, so the screening constant, and by solving this equation you, re you recover the, uh, let's say, the radial part of the wave function and essentially you have, you, 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 you access the, uh, the structure of the atomic orbital in this uh, very, uh, let's say, the simplest way by making those, uh, those uh, spherical, this uh, spherical averaging. This, is, this kind of equation is historically the so-called Hartree equation. Okay, electron by electron, uh, well, without somehow considering or making too much of a uh, taking so much into account the uh, the uh, the structure the rate the the angular part of the wave function because everything has been uh, has been averaged somehow and this is very much like the uh, the equation we we you, you're probably familiar with in the in the hydrogen uh, hydrogen atom description in quantum mechanics so it's very similar some differences and some quantities that we we expect, in particular, the fact that the electrons see do see each other, in particular through this uh, screening effect, which is very important. So there are different strategies. You may just decide that uh, screening is a constant and you can define the Z star quantity, or you can explicitly evaluate this one. I won't get into uh, the details of that, but just to make a first step in the description of reality, which is taking into account the fact that electrons do see each other, which is something that is explicitly over here. Okay, but we want to do better, evidently. We want to make full use of quantum, quantum mechanics. In order to do that, well, we have to first, well, get back to experimental facts. Well, if we look into some electronic configuration, let's say, uh, I will essentially concentrate on a two electron system. Let's say that we, we're interested in a 1s, 2s electronic configuration. Well, from experiments, we know that we have some s state, which is anti-symmetric, and we have some s triplet state, which are symmetric. So this is something that we know from experiments. Well, uh, uh, very honestly, I would not be able to, to, to get into too many details into the, the ways we can, we can extract such information. But let's say we, we use this as some sort of a, some sort of a principle or something that comes from, well, more than a principle, I would say that this is just experiments that tells us that, that this kind of state can be, can be observed. So singlet being anti-symmetric and triplet being symmetric. And we have to cope with that. I mean, this has to be injected one way or the other into the structure of the wave function. Well, just to get back on, on those things, I assume that most of you are aware of that, having a two electron system where we can generate some triplet and singlet. And we know that a triplet, uh, a triplet, or a triplet has a symmetric character with respect to the exchange of the particle, whereas a singlet has anti-symmetric character, okay? And for instance, if you think of the, well, if you just think about the ms equals zero component, well, it can be a linear combination of those two. So electron number one sitting in the alpha, so let's say up electron, beta being down electron. Well, it's a linear combination of alpha, beta, plus or minus alpha two, beta one, okay? And for the triplet, for instance, well, you, you have to use the plus combinations. Well, if you, if you sum this, if you generate this kind of combination of the up, down, plus, down, up. This is the ms equals zero component of the triplet state. The triplet state has three components, ms equal plus one, ms equal minus one, and ms equal zero, the one that I'm, I'm concerned about here. And this is something 
we have to impose in order to somehow be consistent with experiments. Okay, the triplet has to be symmetric with respect to the interchange of those particles. Having this in our hands, now we're somehow, we have one more degree of freedom. We were essentially, we're we were concentrating on the, on the spatial part of the wave function, but there's an extra quantity that has to be included is let's say some sort of a, another degree of freedom that has to do with the, the intrinsic uh, property of the electron, which is the spin degree of freedom. So the spin projection values that can be for an electron plus one and a half or minus one half. And instead of using this Hartree product, well, the idea is to introduce something which is a little bit more uh, complicated, but not so much. And let me somehow guide you into the Slater determinant structuration of the wave function. Now, so now the wave function include this extra degree of freedom, which is the spin part of the electron, okay? For a two electron system, well, we may just write the wave function psi that depends on the coordinate of electron number one and coordinate of electron number two. And let me remind you that x1 and x2 include not just the special part of the wave function, but also the spin degree of freedom, okay? Having this shorthand notation that is very common in most textbooks. Well, by writing down the wave function in such a way using a Slater structure, well, having, let's say, and that might be helpful to follow my presentation is that you can think of the electron occupying a line. So that would be line number one for electron number one, and that would be line number two for electron number two. Whereas columns refer to the so-called orbitals, okay? So those phi ij function are function of the spatial part, spin part, and this is the reason why these are called spin orbitals. And from the time, from now on, I will use phi as a notation for spin orbitals. So that may be a little bit puzzling to introduce a Slater structure for the wave function. However, it becomes very natural. And let me just somehow convince you of that. But for those reasons, in fact, the first one is that, what if you exchanged the role played by electron number one and electron number two? So if you exchange the, the the order of the of the particles, x1, x2, and you exchange that by x1, x2, x1, what you can observe automatically is that there's a change in the wave function. And why is that? Well, again, by having this some sort of a you know, trick to memorize the structure of this determinant, well, exchanging the role of x1 and x2 means exchanging these two lines. Okay, so you swap the order, and by swapping the order of two lines in a determinant, automatically the sign is change, which is something which is very appealing. Why? Because, well, this is something that we want to impose to the structure of the wave function. We do want the anti-symmetry principle to be verified. And this is by using such structure for a two electron, and that's that can be extended to any n electron system, automatically the anti-symmetry principle is recovered. Well, the second one, and that's something that we, we're all aware of. And this is something that I mentioned previously. You remember, not, no two electrons can occupy the same spin orbital. Well, if you do so, what if you say that x1 equal x2 equal x, so I make x, x1 equal x2. So this means that the two electrons occupy the same spin orbitals, well, automatically these two lines are equal. You get identical lines. And we know that in any determinant, if two lines are identical, automatically the value of that determinant is strictly zero. In other words, by squaring this quantity, you access the probability of finding two electrons in the same spin orbital. And the answer is that, well, this probability is strictly zero, which is the so-called Pauli's principle. But as you can see, well, this is simply a consequence. So it no longer has to be raised as a principle. This is just the consequence of the intense anti-symmetry principle, having, let's say, written the structure of the wave function as a Slater determinant. Well, that's a very elegant and compact way to build up, let's say, a wave function, at least a starting point for the wave function. So we went from a Hartree product, so a product of 
one electron function that we call orbitals. And in order to fulfill some of the important rules of construction of well, fermions uh, um, collection, so in particular anti-symmetry principle, well, the, the structure of, uh, of a Slater determinant looks very appealing. So that's a natural structuration for the, uh, the wave function. Okay. So now if we want to generalize that somehow for the, uh, or give a little bit more and get into the details of that. So what we may write is that this, any uh, orbital that depends on the coordinate, full coordinate, including space and spin parts can be written as a product of a orbital, the way I defined it in the Hartree product times some spin path wave function. And something I used previously as a notation the uh, sp spin projection plus one half is referred to as alpha, whereas the spin equal spin projection uh, minus one half is referred to as beta. And therefore, from a from one one orbital, you can generate two spin orbitals: one that is alpha and the other one which is beta. I will I, I may introduce some different notation later on, but I, I will get back to that. Don't worry. Well, regarding the space path of the wave function. Well, for the triplet, ms equals zero, well, we know that the, the, uh, the, triplet, uh, the, the triplet part has a, has, a, has a symmetric, I'm sorry, symmetric, uh, I was confused because there's something, somebody who wants to, to get into the, uh, into, the, uh, into the Zoom session, but probably. Um, so the triplet part is a symmetric and therefore the spatial part has to be intersymmetric. Remember the, the totals, wave function must be anti-symmetric with respect to the interchange of the, the, the role played by the two electrons. And for the singlet part, so S equals zero, M S equals zero, very natural, there's just, just one component, but you get a positive sign over here, very naturally because, well, this structure of the wave function, special part of the wave function is indeed symmetric and it is somehow composed of an anti-symmetric uh, counterpart for the spin contribution. And overall, the product of the spin part times the spatial part remains anti-symmetric. In other words, if the spatial part is anti-symmetric, you have to combine it with a symmetric spin part that gives rise to the triplet state. And as you can see, for that particular triplet state, well, if you make R1 equals R2, well, evidently, the difference between these two contributions is strictly zero. Well, if you like more the uh, probability interpretation, this makes this can be rephrased in, in this way, is that in the triplet state, well, everything goes as if the two electrons were moving somehow, avoiding each other, okay? Because if the, the, the probability of finding that close in space makes this contribution strictly zero. So in other words, R1 must be different from R2 in the triplet, but that's just simply rephrasing the, uh, you know, Pauli's principle that we mentioned previously. Okay, but the good news, or the good news, or something that we can some somehow interpret in a slightly different way, going back to classical mechanics, is that having these two electrons moving somehow, avoiding each other constantly, makes the Coulomb interaction in the singlet, in the singlet component, larger than in the triplet one. Okay, since in the triplet, they want to stay somehow, well, far apart from one from the other. And therefore we can anticipate that the electron, electron repulsion, the quantity that we, we would like to evaluate in, in an accurate way, or the triplet, I'm sorry, the electron-electron interaction should be smaller in the triplet state as compared to the singlet one. And if you go through the, the, the calculation of that, well, you can actually, well, evaluate the energy of the singlet which was, um, minus the energy of the triplet. So that's the E0 minus E minus one. And this goes like 2K IJ. And that's the second quantity I wanted to introduce. We have just talked so far about this Coulomb interaction, which is the one very expected. Electrons are classical particles at first, and there's electron-electron repulsion. But all of a sudden, having this uh, well, somewhat unexpected structure for the wave function, this Slater determinant uh, structure, we have another two electron contribution getting in. And this interaction goes like this. 
and can be using the uh, the previous notation that I have introduced, written as i j j a. Okay. So as you can see, if you go from the Coulomb interaction, well, what you have essentially done is exchange these two indexes. Okay. You remember that was i i j j, and that's the so-called Coulomb interaction. And by exchanging or swapping the order, you generate this kind of interaction. So that can be somewhat well observed or calculated explicitly by, um, um, so I, I, won't, I won't detail that, but you can, what you can observe is that the energy difference between the, the two states, so the two spin states, singlet and triplet, is directly linked to this exchange integral. And by, well, somehow going all the way through uh, the evaluation or uh, of, the, of the energies and, and producing the eigenstates and eigenvalues, the, the, uh, the, the structure of, the, of this two electron system goes like this. So the S equal one state, which is a triplet state that can be represented, well, at least the MS equal plus one component can be represented as this, lies lower in energy and the energy difference between the singlet, as I mentioned over here, is simply 2K and there you have this, you recognize the singlet state, so the the, the minus uh, minus um, component. Well, and that's something that we well we know about. This is simply speaking the so-called Hund's rule, right? So the, uh, this, the the ground state of such system is uh, is given when the the spin the spin multiplicity is maximum. Well, if you if you if you like more. Chemistry, you may just say, well, what kind of system are you talking about? Well, I'm, I'm talking about something that I mentioned as a, some sort of a, you know, experimental facts that I mentioned previously. This could be like the helium excited state. So that could be a 1s2s. And if you think of a 1s2s, well, a configuration, what you may just say, well, do I have a singlet 1s2s lowest lying uh, excited state singlet or a triplet? And what you get from this uh, elementary inspection is that the, the lowest excited state of, of helium, which is a two electron system, is, is a triplet. And most of the, well, the, the important contribution is the, or the, the lead, is this particular exchange integral that makes the, indeed, the triplet lowest, um, the lower in energy with respect to, to, the, to the singlet. So we, we, I think, well, I hope at least that we, we went one step further, starting from the Hartree product, injecting the, the, the spin, uh, spin part of the, um, of, the, of the wave function and building up this later determinant and somehow recovering something that we're, we're aware about is that uh, aware of is the, the so-called Hund's rule that is somewhat, well, demonstrated by, by using uh, this uh, simple derivation. Okay, so um, that's all. Me just excuse, me, excuse me, someone asked you questions. Uh, oh, yes. So somebody, can you read the question or? I, c I cannot read the question. Okay, mark. so I ask, does the omega i, so the spin variable, uh, has some physical meaning? No, well, this is no. This is just one one way one way to somehow generalize. You know, that's for the sake of simplicity. This is just one way to generalize the uh, the writing of the of the coordinate. So instead of having a particle, so electrons that have some let's say spatial uh, spatial uh, that are coordinates, we want to generalize that. This is this is one one way to have a compact writing of the coordinates of the electrons. So there's a Let's say there's a spatial coordinate and a spin coordinate. So this is just one one way. It's it's convenient. Let's let me, let's put it this way. Okay. Okay. So uh, well, the, this is a, going back to the. This is just a reintroducing or reusing the the previous notation that I have introduced. So you recognize again the Slater determinant for a two electron. Uh, wave function. This is one over square root of two. This is just uh, some sort of a normalization uh, factor, which is important if you want to talk in, in particular in terms of probabilities, evidently. And this can be extended in such a way. Okay, so where this is, well, one way to introduce some shorthand notation that might be helpful in the following, where again, electrons are, let's say, 
refer to lines of this determinant. So that would be electron number one, electron number two, electron number n. And this is an n by n determinant, evidently, because we do have like n electron, n electrons. And these occupy orbital i, j, etc., all the way to k. Well, in order to have a more compact writing of such a wave function, we prefer to somehow concentrate on the diagonal part of this wave function. And therefore, uh, and using those bars to remind you that this is a determinant, and this will be written as phi a, phi j, all the way to phi k. But having this notation in your hands, you should always remember that this is a, this is a Slater determinant, so it has anti-symmetry properties, which is precisely what we want. And uh, that Pauli principle is uh, automatically verified. Well, let me just uh, somehow, well, for those of you who may manipulate some non orthonormal uh, atomic orbit or orbitals, generally speaking, well, then the structure, in particular, this uh, normalization factor is different. But I, as I told you, I won't get into many technical details. So, for the sake of simplicity, I assume that this phi j is a orthonormal molecular spin orbital basis set, okay? And in this particular, or assuming that we have produced such basis set, and that's going to be one important uh, uh, target of Hartree-Fock uh, theory, well, we, we can we can have something that looks like a very satisfactory wave function. Well, I'm not saying that this is, again, the holy grail, but that could be a reasonable starting point, having all the, the minimal ingredients of, of, uh, of quantum mechanics introduced in this, uh, in this structure. Okay, so now let me jump into Hartree-Fock equations. And it's going to be rather, let's say, brief, or, but I would, I would like rather to well, introduce the most important uh, concept or the outcomes of, of, of the theory uh, and somehow leave uh, as exercise or something that you can find in textbooks, uh, the, uh, let's say, the derivation of those. I will give you some references at the very end of, the, of this uh, presentation, okay? But let me start with the most important uh, elements of that, that make the, the Hartree-Fock equations. And that will somehow remind you some of those things that we, we have mentioned a few minutes ago, in particular the Hartree equations. You remember Hartree equation, just a Hartree product, so a product of one electron wave function, so we do not have the anti-symmetry principle uh, well installed, and uh, this aver averaging that we have. Well, we want to do something a little bit better, so the, the idea of averaging is still around, but we want to use now this uh, Slater determinant structure of the wave function. And there's one very important element in the Hartree-Fock equation uh, is that the wave function is written as a, just one single Slater determinant. Okay, so we will start this uh, with this uh, minimal well object, and well, we'll see later on whether this is uh, acceptable or not. But for the time being, let's just use a wave function that is just a single Slater determinant. And using the notation that I have introduced uh, a few minutes ago, well, this Slater determinant is written as phi 1, phi 2, etc., all the way to phi n, assuming that the number of electrons is just capital M. So what are we, what are we interested in? Well, we, we want to evaluate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian under the condition that psi, so the wave function we want to evaluate, is normalized, so psi psi should be one. Okay. So minimizing the energy means this quantity delta E should be zero and having some constraints, and that's something extremely important. This is one way somehow to derive Hartree-Fock equations and Emmanuel Formagin will introduce you some other ways, in particular in the context of Cassesiev calculations, but under those constraints that these spin orbitals we want to produce, to generate, so should be orthonormal. They should make an orthonormal basis set. And this is the way I wrote it, by writing that phi a, phi b should be delta a, b. So this is zero if a is different from b, 
and this is equal to one if a equals b. Okay, so we have the orthonormal character which is somehow contained in this in this uh, very short notation. Well, in order to do that, there's one very elegant way, and that is probably common in in, in different disciplines and in different contexts, even in quantum quantum uh, chemistry, uh, is to build up a so-called Lagrangian. Okay, and the idea is by building up the Lagrangian, well, we subtract to the energy, which is the expectation value that is written over here, some sort of a apparently very naive contribution because we know that this quantity should be zero, okay? So I subtract to this quantity, which is the energy of the system. So the, the quantity that we want to minimize something that looks at first rather, rather, uh, rather simple because this is just sub subtracting something that is strictly zero. But the very uh, smart, well, elegant way by of introducing the so-called um, Lagrange multipliers, so those quantity, is that all of a sudden, well, you make the variation of those quantities, so the orbitals, independent one from the other. And that's very important. Once again, by having some constraints, you're not allowed to vary all those quantities independently at first. But the method that has been proposed by Lagrange is by introducing such parameters, such quantities, and immediately what we can see is that those quantities are numbers, this is energies, and therefore this epsilon BA has energy unit, and this is a so-called Lagrange multiplier. And then we enter something which is a, probably a little bit technical, but that's the very elegant and smart way to solve the problem by giving, by producing some, or by looking for uh, atomy of, by looking for molecular orbitals that vary independently. So if you go through the derivation of that, so meaning that you want to make this quantity stationary and making L stationary is strictly equivalent to making this quantity stationary, so delta equals zero, since this is simply speaking zero, you're left with something that is simply speaking the Hartree-Fock, which are simply speaking the Hartree-Fock equations. And that looks very much like a, let's say, Schrodinger-like equation. Interestingly, well, this operator, that is a so-called Fock operator, acts on some, well, unknown that we are interested in. So these are, these are the so-called uh, Hartree-Fock eigenvectors. And this is a one electron operator. Well, as expected, right? There's no surprise behind this. Why is that? Well, simply speaking, because all those phi, I, phi 1, phi 2, et cetera, are simply speaking one electron wave function. So these are orbitals. And what we observe by, again, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm jumping to the conclusion. So having this, uh, this equation set up is that those eigenvalues, those eigenvectors, I'm sorry, are solution of an eigenvalue problem where a one electron operator all of a sudden appears. And that's essentially what I would like to discuss now. So the first point, and this is something very important, is that this is a mono-electronic operator. But again, this is very expected, once again, for the reason that I mentioned before, is that, well, having to, well, in mind the generation of one electron wave function, well, well one electron operator is very expected. And how does this uh, one electron operator read? How, how does it look like? Well, there's a very expected contribution. This is the, you remember the, in the full Hamiltonian, so the, which is H over here, well, we have some one electron operator. Remember, this is something that I mentioned previously, is that the full operator, the full Hamiltonian has a one electron contribution and a two electron contribution, the electron-electron repulsion. Well, and, and therefore, this is very expected that we, we recover the one electron contribution, the one that is that actually contains what well, essentially the kinetic energy of one particular electron that I refer to as electron number one, but there's absolutely no reason when well, the electrons are indistinguishable. So this is just to have some variables over here. So this is, these are the coordinates of electron number one. Well, this particular electron has kinetic energy and it also 
it undergoes the, the field generated by all the, the nuclei, so the external potential. And therefore, well, this is exactly what's behind this particular contribution. Kinetic energy, electron, one electron interacting with all the nuclei, uh, potential energy. So this is very expected, right? And there we have some other contributions, and that this is what makes things very different from the very first and tough approximation that I made, that I made neglecting the electron-electron interaction. We want to include electron-electron interaction, but in, in, in some ways by using this particular description in the Hutchefort context. We have this extra contribution, which is again a one electron contribution. Everything is monoelectronic. The Fock operator is a monoelectron. And there you carry out some summation over some orbitals, A, which are occupied. And that's something very important. And that's physically very understanding because the way one electron moves in the system has to do with the occupation of the other orbitals, so where the other electrons are. Okay, so this summation, no, there's no surprise at all, should be over all the occupied orbitals. And this particular summation is, can be seen as just one potential acting on electron number one. And this is the so-called Hartree-Fock potential. So the Fock operator has one, one electron contribution, which is very expected, plus some also expected because we know that we want to include electron-electron interaction, but that has that splits in two terms. And actually, we have discussed those contributions before. Okay, let me just remind you those things. Well, the first one, J, has to do with, remember, the Coulomb interaction. So this is something coming from classical mechanics, which is very understandable. Electrons do repel each other. So they do have some sort of an interaction, which is the Coulomb repulsive interaction. And this operator, JA, A being some occupied orbital, reads simply as a phi A star phi A. So that's the square of the probability of finding electron number two in some region of space. And this will generate some field that undergoes the electron number one that I'm, that I'm concentrating on. So this is very expected. And not so surprisingly now, we have another contribution that comes in with a negative sign. And the K notation is, refers to the so-called exchange interaction that I have introduced before. And the way Ka acts on some particular spin orbital, as you can see, is a, a locate or ele electron position being number one is being one, I'm sorry, but has to do with the values of this particular uh, spin orbitals everywhere in space. As you can see, the integration or the structure of this exchange operator depends on the value of the wave function we're, we're looking at everywhere in space. Whereas this one has nothing to do with I, right? It just a, it depend. It just acts as a. It's a multiplicative, simply speaking, uh, operator. This one is a little bit well, not problematic, but you should well pay attention to the structure of that. It acts on I, produces A, and as you can see, let me somehow insist one more time on that: is that the way this exchange interactor uh, operator acts has to do with the values of the wave function it acts on everywhere in space. Phi AI is over here, okay? And this is the reason why we said that the Coulomb operator that gets into the Hartree-Fock potential, so this first contribution, is a local operator. Whereas the exchange operator is non-local, and once again, since it, it depends on the values of the wave function it acts on everywhere in space. And that makes these two somehow operator, even though they're both one monoelectronic um, operator, very different. And as you can see, and that's something that we'll get back later on, since we're carrying out integration over X and X include, and that goes back to the question that was raised previously, includes not just the spatial part of the wave function, but also the spin part of the wave function. If you carry out the integration over the spin part, if A and I, so these two spin orbitals, refer to different spin parts, automatically this contribution goes to zero. 
because alpha and beta spin, orbit, um, uh, spin paths are orthogonal. Therefore, as you can see, well, electrons do see each other through J operator, Coulomb interaction. And once again, this is very expected, whereas electrons, well, belonging, let's say, to different spin paths, so one being alpha and the other one being beta, do not see each other. That's somehow one, one way to state things, but that's uh, something that, that must be, that, must, that makes uh, things very different now in the context of the structure that we gave to the wave function. Okay, so one hart operator consisting of two contribution, a Coulomb part and some exchange contribution. And as you can see, these two comes in with a positive and a negative sign. Let me somehow make, well, get back shortly to the previous uh, element that I gave previously, is that uh, the fact that there's a minus sign over here means that, well, this operator will make the energy probably lower when these two electrons sits in the same, sp same spin part, spin orbitals. And this is very consistent with what we said is that well, the, the triplet state for a two electron system should lie lower in energy as compared to the singlet one. Okay, so this is something that has to do with the Hund rule. So this negative sign give, makes the some sort of extra stabilization with one state with respect to the other. So that's somehow one way to look back into the problem that I stated before the, let's say the 1s, 2s uh, excited state electronic configuration for helium, for instance. Okay, so we have now these two operators. So let me somehow write them down in order that, so that we can have some, a clear view on that, that these two operators making the so-called Hartree-Fock potential. So the first one, the, I would say the easiest one, the very expected one, where if you evaluate the expectation value of this one electron operator for some electrons occupying, so let's say some A orbital, read, uh, well, carry out the integration over X1 and X2, Phi, and then you simply follow the, uh, the structure that I gave you previously. Over here, you recognize the Coulomb operator, and this Coulomb operator gets sandwiched by the uh, by this uh, bra and ket a uh, sp spin orbitals, and this can be simply written following the uh, let's say the uh, the notation that I have introduced. Well, this is a a, so that's going to be the a square electronic distribution times b b, and this one over r that sits in. Okay, so that would be some AABB two electron, um, two electron uh, interaction or uh, integral that is simply speaking written as JAB. Okay, something that we've seen before. What about the exchange? Well, the exchange. Well, if you want to evaluate the uh, the uh, exchange integral expectation value, again, just send with that. Uh, get back to the expression that I gave you regarding the exchange operator. You remember this non-local character, which is over here, okay? And uh, by by evaluating this, what you can see in red, you get phi A star phi B. So that means that this is A B, and there you get B A. And so this is electronic distribution A B interacting with B A through one over R, so the electron-electron uh, uh, distance. Okay, so this particular integral or expectation value at first may be written as ABBA. And going back to something that I have introduced before, I told you we would get back to that. Well, as you can see, you go from the Coulomb integral to the exchange integral by simply exchanging these two. You, so you go from ABB to ABBA. So there you have the JAB and KAB integral, which are key ingredients in the structure of the Hartree-Fock potential, which is simply speaking, by noting that, well, you have to carry out some summation over all the occupied orbital JB and KB. And once again, let me somehow well, insist on that. Well, by carrying out the integration over X1 and X2, so automatically what you're going to see is that KB is zero for electrons of opposite spins, which is, again, one way to state things. But if those two spin orbitals be, well, are associated to different spin parts, then automatically this exchange operator does not, then, well, the expectation value is strictly zero. Okay, that's something very important 
which means that if you have two opposite spin electrons, then they do not see each other through exchange interaction, but evidently they do see each other through Coulomb interaction. So there's some sort of a distinction. You have the alphas on one hand, the betas on the other hand. Again, this is one way to state things, but, but well, since electrons are indistinguishable, okay, but this is one way to view the, the problem is that all of a sudden you can see that the alpha do interact on one hand, the beta do interact on the other hand through exchange, and these two communities do interact evidently through Coulomb interactions. So there's some sort of a dis distinction that that has that that is um, that is uh, that that appears all of a sudden. And evidently, well, the the Hartree-Fock potential, well, expectation value can be written as a summation of the b b b being occupied, as the difference between the Coulomb uh, expectation values minus the, the exchange. And uh, somehow the, the electrons, the alphas do see each other. So the displacement of these, but this is something that we knew from before. And this has to do with Powell's principle and, and the beta same way. And that's the, let's say the, the, uh, the writing of the Hartree-Fock potential. So as a conclusion, through the derivation of those Hartree-Fock equation, which is the starting point is just one single Slater determinant, evaluate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, minimizing through that using this very elegant uh, introduction of, uh, of Lagrange multiplier, you're left with something that looks very much like a Schrodinger equation that generates the, these uh, orbitals that we, we're looking at. We, 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 we're chasing somehow, these are the, the, the so-called canonical orbitals. Some, sometimes you may find in the literature canonical orbitals. So these are the orbitals that, that diagonalize somehow the, uh, the, that are eigenvalues of the, of the Fock operator. And in doing so, well, we actually do introduce the electron-electron interaction in some ways. And that's something that I would like to detail now and get into and somehow emphasize. Okay, so this is something that we, we have mentioned and uh, so that the, the alpha and beta form two dissonable, let's say, sets through the K operator. And that has, that's very important and that gives rise to some important properties, which is the so-called spin polarization, for instance, in some systems. And in order to, let's say, stick to something which is, um, which can be considered as a starting point for any types of calculation, let me stick to the restricted Hartree-Fock description or let's say uh, uh, writing of the, uh, of the Fock operator. So by restricted Hartree-Fock, what we mean is that we, we essentially con we're con we're concentrating on closed shell system. So in that particular example, I have like six electrons sitting in three molecular orbitals. So this is the kind of, let's say, description that you may anticipate by using your favorite, uh, let's say, semi-empirical method, the one that I mentioned at the very beginning, let's say the uh, tight binding approximation method that I introduced before, uh, using Huckel theory, okay, and, well, non-interacting electrons somehow. So you may somehow anticipate this kind of thing. And interestingly, this is well kind of picture that you will recover uh, going through the Hartree-Fock equation derivation. In that particular case, where I concentrate on some, something that looks like closed shell, okay, a whole orbital, so these are three over here, are doubly occupied, and that's the reason why I do have like six electrons over here. You may somehow simplify but that's not just simplification. This is also one way to look at the problem in a slightly different way. The, Hart, the, the Fock operator, one electron contribution. And instead of summing up over all the, let's say the occupied orbitals, you sum up just over N over two, but in that case, this is three. And as you can see, the J operator that does not explicitly depends on the coordinate, whereas of this, I'm, so, I'm sorry, the spin coordinate, whereas this one does, because there's no alpha-beta interaction. Well, as you can see, and that's something which is, well, somewhat important, is that the number of exchange interaction is just half the number of Coulomb interaction. And that's one way to, let's say, roughly speaking, in any, any n-electron system, as a rule of thumb, you can just uh, simply, well, evaluate the number, the ratio between these two as being one half or tw twice as many uh, 
Coulomb interaction as the number of exchange interactions, okay? So this is uh, something that can be, well, simply rewriting those things in, instead of uh, by, by carrying out the integration over the spin coordinates that we mentioned before. One more point that I would like to highlight is that if you simply evaluate by using the, the previous expectation value, if you remember I used JB sandwich in the A orbitals, whereas I use the expectation value for the JA operator for the A state and the same thing for the KA exchange operator. And it's rather obvious to remember this is a, this, the first one is simply AA, AA, and the second one is same thing. So these two are strictly the same. And by when you make the subtraction that occurs over here, well, automatically you do have some consolation between these two contributions. So the Coulomb part and the exchange part for the expectation value of the JA and KA oper operator. So this means that there's no electron, electron, uh, well, so-called self-interaction. So this means that no, that one electron doesn't, that doesn't interact with itself through this automatic cancellation between these two contribution. Okay, because this can be simply understood as the, the electron occupying electron, num electron number one occupying orbital A interacting with this with with itself and this makes the cancellation of these of this uh, of this uh, electron self interaction electron interaction okay last probably but not least evidently the structure looks very appealing as we said but as you as you see from the construction of the Fock operator, the Fock operator, this is the one electron expected, well, expected contribution that gets in automatically. The electron moves around, kinetic energy interacts with all the nuclei. So that's very expected. But this one at first seems, well, looks well rather elementary, but it's not since this operator or those operator depends on all the molecular orbitals. So now I'm looking for, you know, eigenvalues of some problem, which is this uh, Fock operator eigenvalue problem. But the Fock operator structure is to be constructed on some a set of spin orbitals through this contribution, right? Because this has to do with the occupation of a given set of orbitals. So at the very beginning, let's say, of the, of the calculation or, or the evaluation, I do not have any idea what the Fock operator looks like, right? Because I want to diagonalize some object that is directly constructed on its proper eigenvalues, eigenfunctions, I should say. Okay, this is something that I wrote over here. So this Fock operator is a function of the occupied eigen, eigenfunctions. So how do we solve the problem? Well, we have to go through some iterative um, procedure. So this means that we feed somehow the calculation with a, let's say, a zero folder or a starting point, let's say some a set of molecular orbitals that can be generated either using the atomic orbitals or you can, let's say, carry out some very simple calculation, let's say kind of a tight binding calculation in order to generate something that looks like a reasonable, acceptable electronic distribution. Diagonalize this Fock operator, generate a new set of eigenvalues in order to reconstruct the Fock operator. And you do that until well, until convergence. So this means that the eigenvalues that are generated are not so different with some particular threshold that you decide on from the, the ones that, that, that you use to feed the procedure. Okay, so this is what we call a self-consistent procedure. And overall, using this uh, kind of strategy, which is, uh, which is very uh, common, in the, common in the context of quantum chemistry, we, we go through a self-consistent field SCF procedure. SCF is some acronym that gets in quite often. Emmanuel, you do have a question? Yes, there is a question. So I'm not sure. So the question is, uh, could you please explain how you have just two Coulomb integration in your diagram? So I guess it's the factor two that appears in the in the Fock okay, operator. The, the red one that appears over here. I guess, I guess if I understand the question okay. correctly. But if you choose, well, let me somehow just pick one example that, that might be helpful over here by simply using at this uh, molecular diagrams that I sketched sim for simplicity, just to, to, to remind you that this is something that you probably have seen in the context of, let's say, even elementary type 
well, calculations such as Huckel calculations. Well, let me concentrate on this very first electron. Well, from a very physical, well, well, numbering, let's say, of the interaction. Well, this particular electron has five, one, two, three, four, five. Like, okay, it sees like five electrons through Coulomb interactions. And we know that from coming again from classical electrostatics. So the number of interaction of this particular electron is equal to five. Whereas this particular electron, which is an up electron, and again, this is a little bit, you know, probably these, these words are for the sake of simplicity. This is one way to, to look at the problem. Once again, electrons are indistinguishable, but that's, a, that's an easy way, let's say, to, to state things. Well, this particular electron has just two exchange interaction with these two because it has no uh, it has no exchange interaction with the down with the beta electrons and uh, as I mentioned before this is a consequence of the of the alpha beta being uh, also orthogonal uh, eigen spin eigenvalues so this means that the number of electrons the number of interaction that we have is um, for this particular electron it interacts through Coulomb interaction with five other electrons, whereas it interacts with two other electrons through exchange. And by summing up all on all pairs, you'll get back to this particular to this particular expression. Okay. So, well, if I may, that could be to complement what I've just said, is that by when oops, maybe one more, yes. Over here, when you define this particular summation over occupied orbitals, so this is occupied, I'm sorry, I should say spin orbitals. When you sum up over spin orbitals, what you may just say is that the each spin orbitals is associated with one alpha and one beta occupied spin orbitals. Okay. So the number of uh, I'm sorry, Coulomb interaction that you that you that you get that you retrieve is exactly twice the number of uh, exchange interaction that you have, because exchange interaction occur for spin-like uh, orbitals only. Okay. Okay. So let me get back to yes to this particular um, view. So I, I was I was getting to the point that we have to go through this uh, iterative uh, resolution until we reach uh, self consistency, and self consistency means that well essentially the the Fock operator has been diagonalized. So this means that well and again this is done this is carried out numerically. In other words, uh, well we but but in the end if you if you if you accept the a certain level of accuracy. You self consistency has to has to do with the fact now that the Fock operator has been diagonalized, and this can be written in such a way. And the eigenvalues, I mean, the that, that you get from out from this uh, self consistent field procedure, are eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. They do form the so called canonical orbitals of the of the problems. Okay, and well, the structure of the Fock operator is such that these uh, eigenvalues, uh, eigenvectors, I'm sorry. Are orthonormal. Okay, the Fock operator has a symmetrical or Hermitian char character, and therefore automatically you get something which is diagonal. Okay, so in other words, what, what what's the if I may just pose or discuss the, the contribution of Hartree Fock with respect to the initial first steps of Hartree description of electron electron interaction? Well, in this context, we have included. What, what we want were parts, more elements, more ingredients coming from quantum mechanics. Not just that, but we have somehow well taken into account the details of the structure of the electronic distribution without, you know, sticking to this uh, spherical averaging. So this is something that is that complements the very initial views. But I would say that the spirit is is very similar. Is that we end up with something that describes the well the the the, the movement, if I, if I may use this uh, terminology, of a one particular electron in the field generated by the, all the other electrons and evidently the field generated by the nuclei. Okay, so this external potential, but the field generated by the, the other electrons being somehow averaged and there's no longer spherical averaging. But importantly, the, what you should 
view what you should um, look at well the way you should view those Hartree-Fock equation or, or description of electrons in a, in in a system in a molecule is that one particular electron undergoes a mean field generated by all the other electrons so the n minus one electrons in other words and that somehow to make to goes back to the my very first words is that instead of somehow neglecting or moving out, leaving out this one over R12, so the electron electron repulsion, we have somehow replaced this particular instantaneous electron electron interaction by something that is average. And that's, let's say, the what's behind this Hartree-Fock potential. Everything goes as if we had one effective potential, though, so the Hartree-Fock potential, which is an electron-electron interaction, Coulomb and exchange contribution that acts on each individual electrons. And that makes the, let's say, the, um, the, the electronic, the, the overall and electron electronic distribution. So mean field is something that is very important, something that I left very, uh, as a few words that I dropped at the beginning, which is very important. Hartree-Fock, uh, let's say Hartree-Fock theory is a mean field approximation. We want, we don't, we do, we're not aware or we're not concerned or we don't want to include the instantaneous electron-electron uh, interaction. Okay, uh, in practice, uh, I won't be very, I will, I will rather be short on that. Well, because this is more technical, but techniques is very important. And I do, don't want to underestimate this important uh, part. Emmanuel, yes. Um, yes, sorry. There is a, a general question before getting into the technical details. So someone asked, could you please explain the physical significance of the self-interaction? Well, this self-interaction, and that's probably going very much discussed in the context of density functional theory. But if you go, if you simply, you know, go back to the uh, to the expression of this A J A A uh, Coulomb interaction, well, this means that that's one contribution that makes as if one electron does interact with itself, and that's something that you well for obvious reason or something that we may discuss more. But this is something that you don't want to take into account. So if you think in terms of, let's say, in terms of density, electronic density, well, the, the electron density is generated by, by let's say, the, the, N, the N electron assembly. And if you think in terms of density, all of a sudden, when you evaluate the electron electron repulsion, you're not, you're not so much aware of what is the contribution of a given electron to this particular quant well, amount of electronic density in one region of space, and the same for this particular one. So all of a sudden, you may be, you may be left with something that looks like as if part of the electron density that is generated over here by electron number one inter interacts with part electron density that is generated by the same electron in some other part of space, and that's the origin of electron electron self interaction. Everything is as if, if I may use this uh, this way, if you were to you know cut electrons in pieces and make those pieces interacting with each other. And that's something that you don't want to evidently take into account because you start with particles, electrons, and that's, well, evidently the theory that makes it this way. And this electron, electron self interaction should not be, should not appear. And that's something that you will discuss probably in more details in density functional theory. Yeah, somebody else was asking, why do we worry about this? Because actually there is no self-interaction error in Hartree-Fock. But as you said, it's a problem in density functional theory. Right. Because so that, that was somehow yeah. you know, to leave, leave hand to, to people who will discuss uh, yeah. other yeah. lectures that you will have. And in particular, when you think in terms of, of density functional theory, you have, well, well dens density is interacting, but you're not, well, let's say, if I may, um, well, aware of the fact that well, the elect the density generated on some some part of space has to do with one particular electron, and the same thing holds for some other part of space. So all of a sudden, you may uh, you may face the problem of have, uh, having one electron interacting with itself, and let's say in, in this particular context, so in the Hartree-Fock theory, you don't have such 
particular issue. And the reason is that, well, you have this automatic cancellation between the Coulomb and the exchange contributions. Okay, that's very naive in terms of, you know, by simply, well, you subtract those two contributions, but, but, but it becomes something extremely important in some other contexts that will be uh, discussed uh, later on in the, in the density functional theory lectures. Okay, so if, if no, I suppose that when I see you, Emmanuel, this is that there's some. Yeah, I'm just questions. reading because somebody Thank asked if we have a realistic system, is it correct that the self interaction would be important? But I guess you, you answered that, that this is unphysical and it's not a problem in Hartley Fock because you have the exact exchange energy, right? It's more a DFT problem. But I guess Julien will talk about this in yeah. his lecture. Well, that's. Well, the, probably the answer would be that, uh, well, if, if the number of electrons grows, well, what you may expect is that, well, probably this problem is, uh, is less important that for a, well, for a system that consists of a small number of electrons. So, well, but, but Julien, will, Julien Toulouse will, will discuss those things uh, in probably many more details and using different words. So that's going to be, I hope, that will complement what, what we're currently discussing. So you can move on, Vincent. We, we still have like half an hour in total. So uh, okay, yeah. thank you for checking time. I do You're have my watch over here. Yes, half an hour. Okay, great. Uh, so <clears throat> in practice, and, and, and something that I was saying, I, um, well, those um, I mean, setting up these uh, equation is one thing, but now you have to implement that or think in terms of implementation. Many codes available. And I, I won't discuss the, the performance or and everyone can choose his, his own favorite one. But just to give you some, well, some a few technical things, going back to the important concept of linear combination of atomic orbitals, so this LCAO method, where you actually write down some molecular orbitals as a linear combination of atomic orbitals. So here the chi mu are the atomic orbitals, whereas the phi i are the molecular orbitals. And M, so the total number of the basis set, so the size of the basis set can go up to 1,000. But that was a few years ago, so probably the performance can be way above that. But just to give you a flavor, you know, so that could be a few hundreds of atoms without any problem. And I'm not getting into the, you know, the competition of the, the largest calculations. I don't want to discuss those things, but just to give you a flavor of 1,000 atomic orbitals makes a system consisting, let's say, of, let's say, 100 carbon atoms, okay, depending on the, well, the, the accuracy that you want to reach. But essentially, what you think of is that this will make the, the matrices of sizes. So automatically, you're going to manipulate some n times n matrices and defining, well, atomic orbitals, who knows, they might not be orthogonal, and that makes the so-called overlap matrices that you might be aware of. So this is a one electron matrix. Okay, so this is defining the mu and nu indexes. And most of the basis set that you find in code are not are not uh, orthogonal. So you have to well you have to manipulate and that's some sort of a price you must pay by having a S match matrix which is not strictly identity. Okay. And then you have to evaluate well or or write down, let's put it this way, the Fock operator in the basis set of the of the atomic orbitals. And that's the so-called Fock matrix. So these two have to be manipulated. And the, eigenval the eigenvalue problem that I wrote previously can be written in a basis set. So that's the, uh, so this is the, uh, the, the writing down the, the, the Fock equation in an atomic basis set, and it goes this way. And as you can see, this looks very much like an eigenvalue problem. Okay, but it's not strictly speaking an eigenvalue problem because you have this particular S matrix. However, those are called the so-called Ruthans equations, which are strictly speaking, well, setting up or writing down the Hartree-Fock equation in some atomic orbital basis. Set. And these are the typical equations that are solved in any Hartree-Fock code that is available, as I said, in many different codes. Okay, so this looks very much like, uh, like an eigenvalue problem, slightly different. And actually, there are some tricks by introducing the S minus one half, etc. I won't get into too many details um, that you can find in some of the textbooks that I, that I mentioned 
in the end that I will give you at the end of the presentation. But in order to make one more step in the, let's say, in the practical use of Hartree-Fock uh, theory, how do, we, how do we solve the problem? Well, essentially what you can find in the literature are two types of orbitals. You can come across Slater type orbitals or Ga Gaussian type orbitals and contractions in order to reduce the, the cost of the calculation. But, but again, I won't get into too many details of that. Just to give you an example, these are, well, interesting type of orbitals because they're very much like atomic-like. You remember I told you, the, if you think in terms of the, the P, the, the polynomial um, uh, and the expression of the, of, the, of the radial part of the wave function, uh, goes like some exponential decaying uh, wave function. So in that particular example, I use a, what we call a double zeta. So if you come across in the literature DZ, this stands for double zeta. In other words, what you should think of is that the number of parameters that have to be optimized throughout the calculations might be A1, A2, and those coefficients are set, okay? But actually, these are atomic-like orbitals, so most of the time what you decide on is that this is a linear combination, A1 and A2 are fixed values, and these are the, the, way, the way those exponential decay. And these also are, are found, have, have been optimized somehow. And this would be a double zeta atomic basis set. And by making some linear combination of such object, depending on the coordinate of one single electron, let me insist on that, which is an orbital, then you can somehow generate uh, some uh, molecular orbitals in a Slater type atomic like basis set. The other option that you have, and this is, has to do with uh, essentially uh, technical issues by using Gaussian type orbitals. So the main difference between, a, as you see, a Slater type orbital and a Gaussian orbital is that this goes like R squared. So that's, well, what mathematicians call a Gaussian orbital. What's sticking to the radial part? Well, this, instead of using Slater, Slater basis set, you may like to use a linear combination of Gaussian. And there you enter the field of, well, the, uh, you know, the, the variety and the, the zoology of, of, uh, of a basis set. So I just pick one as an example that you may have found or some of you may have used, the sort of very famous 631G. This means that the core are described by six Gaussian orbital and the valence part is described as three plus one. So this is what we call split valence description for a basis set. But this is just one among a collection and I don't want to get into too many details. Okay, so these essentially are the two options that I can be found, mostly found. I'm not a specialist. There might be some other options. Evidently, you can use plane waves if, you, if you're more in the field of you know, extended system in the solid state, for instance. And there are some other varieties, but probably um, my colleagues who are more physicists will tell you more on that. So essentially, the basis set consists of a radial part, which is described either as a Slater type linear combination or Gaussian type linear combination times evidently some angular part and the angular part is, well, the, the one that I mentioned, this YLM spherical harmonics. This is the starting point and by making linear combination of those, you generate molecular orbitals and essentially what the code does for you is to optimize the amplitudes or the coefficient describing each molecular orbitals described as a linear combination of atomic orbitals. Okay, so essentially what it does that the codes evaluate those quantities. Okay, and once you know those, you know the atomic orbitals and once you know the, the molecular orbitals, I'm sorry, and once you know the molecular orbitals, then you're, you're left with the canonical orbitals at the end of the self-consistent uh, procedure. Yes, Emmanuel? Yeah, sorry. So there was a question actually asking how you check the convergence, but you, okay, you get the answer now with these coefficients, right? You have to look at those and check that they yeah, convergence don't change. Is reach. Yeah, you can, you can, you can look at the, well, there are different, uh, different, um, let's say, threshold that can, you, you can decide on. You can look into the, let's say, the, the energies, uh, the energy, the individual, um, 
uh, canonical orbital energy, so the eigenvalues of the of the Fock operator, and and look at the variation from one iteration of, with respect to the to the other, and well. This is one one threshold. You can also look at this, and that's a rather important. Look at the structure of the wave function. So the, the coefficient of the defining the molecular orbitals uh, should not vary so much. And by saying this, you decide on some sort of a threshold. And once uh, once there's no longer any variation under one certain threshold conditions, well, this, the calculation stops. And this is where you consider that convergence has been reached. So there are different tricks uh, you know, it's not just, well, there are many, many inputs have been put into the, uh, let's say the coding of the, the implementation of the method as many other methods, but this is something that is, uh, that you have to dig into if, if you're very much interested in that. But essentially threshold on the energies on the structure of the wave functions are the most, uh, most common one that you should check on. And these are given in the outputs most of the time, if you, if you carry out some calculations. Okay, uh, so just a few words on, well, to compare with the restricted Hartree-Fock, you may come across unrestricted Hartree-Fock. And the main difference between those two is that all of a sudden the spatial part of the alpha and beta can be different. So there's, there's more flexibility, let's say, when you carry out unrestricted Hartree-Fock calculations, because in the previous one, in the restricted one, what you, what you, what you assume is that each molecular orbitals are, doubly, are either doubly occupied or unoccupied, okay? In this context, well, you have a set of alpha, let's say, orbitals and a set of beta orbitals, and the energies of these can be different. So that makes, evidently, life a little bit more tedious. It's a little bit more demanding in terms of calculations because all, all of a sudden, well, you have to somehow split between the, the alpha and the beta, okay? So you have and a, a FOC operator for the alpha and a FOC operator for the beta. So let me just briefly somehow describe the structure of the FOC operator for, let's say, one subset of electrons for the alpha one. Evidently, you get the, well, the one electron, again, kinetic energy, electron nucleus, uh, nuclei interactions. And we know that these particular alpha electrons interact through Coulomb and exchange, okay? We know that because, well, exchange is, is non-zero because now we're considering all, only the, the alpha electrons that do interact with this particular, well, electron number one, which, is, which occupies some alpha orbitals. What about the beta? Well, the beta do interact through Coulomb interaction. That's something that we, 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 we mentioned several times, but there's no counterpart exchange. And why is that? Well, because we know that alpha and beta do not in interact through exchange interaction. So as you can see, the structure is very similar. You get the alpha Coulomb and the beta Coulomb interaction and just the alpha exchange interaction that gets into the definition of the Fock operator for this particular alpha subset. So automatically you get some coupling evidently between the, you know, sigma stands for the spin part, so alpha and beta. So you get the, 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 the Coulomb and exchange for the same subset alpha, alpha, beta, beta, and there's this coupling between the two different uh, uh, sub subset of equations, so the alpha Fock operator and the beta one. So you have to solve these two using the self-consistent procedure, and these two are coupled. Well, as you may expect, this is a little bit more demanding. So how do we solve that in, in practice? Uh, something that I mentioned previously, this is not strictly speaking some sort of a this is more on techniques, uh, an eigenvalue problem, but this can be somehow rewritten, is strictly speaking, an eigenvalue problem by introducing this S minus one half. So for those of you, and I, I was very much surprised the first time I saw S minus one half, well, this is just one way of writing down the S matrix. That's a, that's a symmetric matrix. So we know that it can be diagonalized. And once it has been diagonalized, you just take the invert of the, of the eigenvalues and square those eigenvalues. And this is what I mean by S minus one half, okay? So a matrix can be diagonalized and you just pick the eigenvalues, take the invert of those, square this, and this defines S minus one half. Well, if you plug that in into this equation, you're left with something that looks in that case, like very much like an eigenvalue 
problems, right? So these are the eigenvectors, the C prime are the eigenvectors of this transform FOC operator F prime and epsilon are the eigenvalues. This is one very elegant way, and I assume, as, as much as I know, codes are usually use this kind of transformation because this is this is done at the very first step of the iteration because the S matrix is defined, so you can diagonalize and define this S minus one half, and then you go throughout the the SCF procedure uh, and retrieving some what I stated as a standard eigenvalue problem. Okay, this is. A little bit technical, but that's uh, that's usually the way the, the problem is effectively solved in standard codes, I would say. So that's very general for restricted and unrestricted. Back to unrestricted, we have the alpha and the beta on the alpha on one side and the beta on the, on the other, having these two uh, operators that must be diagonalized simultaneously, having the coupling between these two. And there's one important drawback for that, and that's something that you can check in any UHF for unrestricted Hartree-Fock method is that the, the S square, uh, so the, the square of the total spin operator no longer reads as SS plus one. So this means that you get all of a sudden some sort of a spin contamination issue. Well, in other words, what you, you may rephrase that by saying that the eigenvalues that you get from this procedure are no longer I should have stressed this point, has no, there's no spin contribution in that, right? That's just Coulomb interaction and I assume a non-relativistic uh, Hamiltonian right from the beginning. So this means that the, the eigenfunction that we get must be eigenfunction of the S square spin operator because the Hamiltonian commutes with the S square uh, uh, operator, this particular S square operator. Unfortunately, in the UHF, um, so unrestricted Hartree-Fock uh, theory, we do we no longer have this particular property. So this is some sort of a drawback. So this means, in other words, that the eigenvalues that you get are no longer, let's say, um, well, realistic uh, states of the system. Even though we are still far from a very well describing states, but they have they have this uh, particular uh, singularity or that that is a spin contamination. So on the one hand, you improve because you lift some, some of the constraints, having two electrons or having the alpha and the beta sharing the same spatial part. By lifting this, you have more freedom, let's say, in the description of the system. So evidently, the energy must go down because the, the, the constraints are less because of this flexibility that is allowed to the structure of the wave function. But on the other hand, what you have is that you how you are left with something which is not which is not so realistic. So how much of spin contamination, how much you can use of that? Well, this was in the in the good old days, one way to introduce, you know, part of what we, we would like to talk about, the correlation. So more beyond Hartree Fox, so things that we will de detail later on. Yes, Emmanuel. Yeah, sorry. So there was a, a question about that because now things look more complicated when you work in the atomic orbital basis because they are they are not orthogonal. So someone is asking why you don't just do like a Schmidt decomposition and and yeah. work in an orthogonal basis. But uh, yeah, this is well, this is this is one way to, to 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 solve the problem. Indeed, what you may just do is that right at the beginning, what you may just say is that you can orthogonalize the the atomic orbitals, but then. But then that's more in terms of, you know, interpretation or reading of the wave function is that all of a sudden by doing this kind of orthogonalization, you can use Schmidt or Lovdin or orthogonalization. There are different ways to starting with a non-orthogonal basis set generate some orthogonal, an orthogonal basis set is that automatically you tend to delocalize the atomic orbitals. So when you make linear combination of delocalized orbitals, which are no longer strictly speaking atomic-like orbitals, well, this is kind of in terms of reading and interpretation. Well, unless you simply draw those orbitals, well, evidently you have some, you know, softwares and if, well, we, we like to see orbitals and well describing, you know, probabilities. And this is something that evidently most codes um, offer you, but, but it's more like if you read the coefficient by simply reading the coefficient, now you do not have, let's say, well, this is a contribution on atom number one, because now the atomic orbitals through the orthogonalization procedure makes those orbitals fully delocalized. 
the price you pay by orthogonalization is delocalization. That's something that you you must always be aware of. I will say a few words on on localized techniques, which are extremely appealing. But essentially, when you, when you when you want to manipulate or if you want to stick to localized orbitals, where or to atomic like orbitals, well, but stay away from orthogonalization. Otherwise, delocalization automatically gets in. It's good for large scale calculation also, I guess. You can use sparsity of the density metrics if you work yeah. in the atomic orbital basis. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly, yes. If you want to yeah. split the system in, in pieces, then you should stay away from delocalized and delocalized structures. So there's some codes like Siesta, for instance, that was essentially based on, on localized orbitals. And, and well, the, some orbitals are strictly orthogonal, but thanks to, well, simply on, on distance and criteria between atoms, and that makes these matrices uh, sparse. Or, and so the, the, time, the, the price you must pay to diagonalize those is less. That's, uh, that's one thing that you can take advantage of. Maybe I should move on. Yes? Yeah, we have uh, 10 minutes left. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay, so let me get into practical practice, H2. H2 is a good example because it's very appealing, very simple. And let's, let's say, play the game very naively, getting into the Hartree-Fock equation, okay? So I start with a minimal basis set, 1s on each atom. And if you just forget about, let's say, for the for a few seconds, the Hartree-Fock theory, you know that probably more for chemists, but I assume that physicists are also aware of that. You generate what we call a bonding orbital and anti-bonding orbital. Okay, so this one lies lower in energy as compared to that one. But if you were to enter the field of Hartree-Fock theory, you might just say, well, I want to write some, find some molecular orbitals, phi one and phi two, as linear combination of A and B, A and B being the atomic orbitals. So I use exactly the same notation, some molecular orbitals being a linear combination of atomic orbitals. Well, you can use group theory, there's a symmetry point, so you automatically get to the to the conclusion that the absolute value of chi one and chi two should be one over square root of two. And this defines phi one G being gerade bonding orbitals and phi two U ungerade anti-bonding orbitals. And then, well, self consistently is automatically achieved because these two are, are different symmetries, F is symmetric, so automatically you get the, this I, well, this, uh, this uh, matrix element that is zero, FGG is just the energy of epsilon is, written as epsilon g, you remember this is the Lagrange multiplier, and fuu, which is the expectation value of the Fock operator for this particular orbital, is epsilon u, okay? So what is the energy of epsilon g? So that can be understood from, let's say, elementary analysis. Well, if I put an electron in this particular orbital, well, it has the electron, well, the hgg, so this is the, the matrix elements having well, well the, the, the one electron operator, kinetic energy, electron nuclei, there are two nuclei in that particular case, contribution. So this is very expected. But sitting in that particular orbital, well, this electron has, there's a, there's a, there's a counterpart or there's a companion over here, and there's a electron-electron interaction. And this electron-electron interaction is a Coulomb interaction. Are there any exchange interaction? Well, the, the answer is no, because there's one spin up and one spin down. So there's no exchange interaction between those two. So epsilon g is automatically, can be calculating using the Hartree-Fock potential, but from, I mean, a very elementary physical analysis can be written as this, some of these two contribution. What about epsilon u? Well, you can carry out the same analysis, but the main difference now is that this orbital is vacant, unoccupied, okay? So how do I evaluate the energy of an unoccupied orbital? Well, one way to do that is, let's say, to use some probe electrons, the fictitious electron that you put in this particular orbital, and evaluate the energy of that, assuming that the energy has not changed. This is just one way to probe okay, the energy of that. Well, if you just put an electron over here, how much of energy does it have? Well, it's HUU, very expected as it was HGG sitting in, the, in, the, in that case in the antibonding orbital. And this red electron that I chose as an up electron, I could have used a down electron, does have some Coulomb interaction with these two. So this is why you get these two G, J, G, U. And there's one counterpart because this red electron, which is an up electron, interact with that one through exchange interaction. And as you can see, there's these two 
Coulomb interaction minus one exchange interaction. So this can be ex well extracted in different ways, but that becomes very natural from a simple physical analysis, let's say. So now back to the to reality, I mean, to the, to the N-electron system, how much is the Hartree-Fock energy? Well, assuming that Psi, again, in the Hartree-Fock uh, context, is written as a one electron, as a single determinant. And I use the notation, which is quite uh, current in the, in the quantum chemistry, as A bar. A bar stands for a beta electron. So this means that the A orbital, spin orbital, is occupied and the A bar spin orbital is occupied. This means that the spatial part is labeled as A, and A bar means that there's a beta electron sitting in that. Okay, so that's something which is very standard. So if you go back to H2, what you may expect is that the energy of H2, so the artifact energy using this kind of a GG bar uh, a single determinant, would be twice the energy of, well, two electrons sitting in this G orbital, so you get two times this quantity, which is the kinetic energy electron nuclear interaction, and these two electrons repel each other through J. So this is something that you can immediately anticipate. How does this compare to twice the energy epsilon G that I mentioned before? You remember epsilon G is over here. So if you double this quantity and compare that to the Hartree-Fock energy that I have just evaluated, as you can see, the energy of H2 is not just twice the energy of the eigenvalue epsilon g, which is something that I wrote at the very, very beginning of this lecture. But now electrons do see each other. So there's one extra contribution. So in other words, and more generally, what you may say is that the, the Hartree-Fock energy is not simply speaking the summation over the single, the single uh, electron uh, energy of, of occupied orbitals. That's something that is, I mean, you must be aware of, but I think that's very, very understandable. But what is interesting is the analysis that we can have from that. Well, if you derive, or if you express the expectation value using what we call Slater rules, and I leave use this as an exercise, what you can show is that the, the Hartree-Fock energy reads like this. And by injecting the expression of the eigenvalues, so the one electron energies, what you may, you may rewrite this quantity as a summation over the energies of the occupied orbitals, spin orbitals, minus one half of this quantity. And I know that it's a very condensed lecture, but if you go back to my, to some a few transparency before, this is just the expectation value of the Fock operator. So what you subtract over here is one half of the electron-electron interaction. In conclusion, the Hartree-Fock energy is the summation over the, all the occupied spin orbitals, but each individual spin orbital contains the, evidently the kinetic energy, the interaction of one electron with, all, with the nuclei, and the interaction of this particular electron with all the other electrons. So I guess that you understand that now by summing up all these energies, there's a double counting of the electron-electron interaction because there's one electron number one sitting in the orbital epsilon a that sees all the other electrons, in particular electron number two. And when you evaluate the energy coming from this occupation of electron one that has to do with electron number two, this electron number two sees electron number one through Coulomb interaction and possibly exchange interaction. In other words, by summing up these, there's a double counting of the electron-electron interaction, which has to be, and this is why you get this minus sign subtracted from here. But this expression is nothing but a generalization of what we have over here and that we clearly understood by a simple mathematical uh, manipulation, okay? This is an extension of that. And this contribution, again, avoids the double counting of the electron-electron interactions. Okay, more, and probably I will stop on that or say a few words, okay? And this is a two important a theorem that comes immediately from the uh, Hartree-Fock theory. So the first one is the so-called Brillouin, Brillouin theorems that says that any, so starting from one particular electronic configuration, so that would be the Slater determinant with six electrons occupying those three low-lying uh, canonical orbitals, well, if you promote one of those electrons, so you generate another 
type of determinant using something that will be introduced uh, later on by Emmanuel, the so-called second quantization from the Hartree-Fox solution, you generate what we call a single excited determinant. This is just promoting one electron from, let's say, orbital, spin orbital A to spin orbital R. And what can be easily demonstrated is that the matrix elements between this single excitation and the Hartree-Fock reference one is strictly zero for mathematical reason. This is one something uh, ingredient that you can retrieve from the Hartree-Fock theory. The second one is some sort of an interpretation of these eigenvalues. And just to get back on these quantities, these were, simply speaking, this uh, mathematical trick so the Lagrange multipliers that we have introduced in order to derive the Hartree-Fock equation. Well, actually, they do have some physical interpretation. And what can be demonstrated is that the amount of energy that you have to give to the system to remove one electron, in other words, to generate a cation starting from, let's say, a neutral system, or more generally speaking, going from an n electron system to an n minus one electron, if you make the difference between those two, you give rise to one important quantity, which is the so-called ionization potential, while this quantity is simply speaking minus the eigenvalue epsilon a. So you can, you can somehow have some interesting quantity that can be compared immediately to experiments. And the same thing holds for some unoccupied orbitals. Okay, so these are important, or let's say, uh, theorem or yeah, theorem and, and quantities that can be retrieved from a single uh, from the Hartree-Fock theory, and these these are these are elements that you can find in many textbooks. So, if I may just conclude briefly on that, I will say more later on, and that will be something that we will share with Emmanuel. So, I just well, Hartree-Fock must be considered as a as a starting point in any electronic structure description, and probably important elements that I would like to well to to, to transmit is that this is a mean field approximation. And uh, mean field approximation means that probably we lose or we miss some of the interaction. And that's essentially the reason why this is just a starting point. And later on, I will show you that there are some missing information in the Hartree-Fock approximation. And how can we cure that? How can we solve the problem? Well, we have to go further using either some variational method. And that will be mostly, I think, uh, we'll, we'll share that with Emmanuel Fromager. So that will be uh, given by Emmanuel Formazier's lecture. Or you can use uh, another slightly different strategy, which is the so-called perturbation theory. And I will, I will, I will, I will do my best to, to, to present you some of those strategies in, in the context of perturbation theory. Here are some references that I mentioned several times in the presentation. And evidently, I would like to, to wish you all the best and uh, stay in good shape. And thank you very, very much for attending this uh, this unexpected but but uh, beautiful. And thank you for the for the organizer and particularly for uh, Emmanuel for setting up uh, this uh, very nice uh, summer school. So wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent. Well, I think we should all uh, thank you first, of course. Thank you very much. And also, we thank should you. thank uh, Francesco, who took care of all the practical yeah, thank problems. You. Thank you, Francesco, so very much. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So I don't know if we have like one minute left, maybe because somebody was asking uh, if you prefer Gaussians or uh, Slater functions uh, for the basis sets. But uh, well, it's not really a matter of taste, right? Uh, well, my my answer would be well, if you well the. Well, competition between these two strategies is not, I mean, it's not, it's more like in terms of interpretation. Well, the, the good thing with the, with the Slater orbitals is that they're very much like, you know, the atomic, they're very much like atomic-like orbitals. So this means that they, you start with, with the objects, that, let's say orbitals in these, in, which are very much like the, the ones that you have in, in atoms. So, but evidently, if you work with Gaussian orbitals, well, as you can see, a Gaussian orbitals, it has a zero derivative in, in the vicinity of the nucleus of when R goes to zero. And therefore, to mimic the structure of the wave function, so the so-called cusp in the in for R going to zero, you have to pile up to accumulate more than just one single Gaussian orbital. So this means, in other words, normally when you when you go from let's say Slater type orbital to Gaussian basis set you have to manipulate many more orbitals. But the price you have to pay for doing that might be overcome by the fact that 
well, Gaussian orbitals are, are nice, are really well manipulated because when you make a product of those two, well, they, there are some mathematical, let's say, tricks that makes them very convenient to manipulate. So my answer would be just, just use your favorite <laughs> set of orbitals. And depending also on how much you want to, how much information you want to retrieve in particular in the vicinity of the nucleus. So if you want to do NMR calculations, you want, you're very much aware of what, what goes in, you know, hyperfine interaction, this kind of thing. You have to be very well cautious on, on, the, on the density in the very close vicinity of the nucleus. So there you may have to use extended basis set if you go for Gaussian type orbitals. I don't have myself any preferences, I would say. Well, it's practical for the evaluation of two electron integrals for sure. So I guess yes. this is why people yeah. use that. Yeah. yeah. But you're right for the physics, it's a different thing. Okay, so uh, thank, thank you very much, Vincent, again. Thank everyone you. is thanking you. There's a long list of thank you, thank you now in the chat box, so. Well, thank you to you all. I guess we're, we're done, right? Yeah. So, uh, okay, so then we see you next week on Tuesday, I think, if I'm right. Yep. But Francesco will keep you all updated anyway. So bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for attending this lecture and take good care. Bye-bye.